This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. President Reagan is again trying to defend his old friend, political operative, and U.S. Attorney General Ed Meese. He said today Meese should not resign. Mr. Reagan said this despite being told point blank by two former top aides to Meese that the Attorney General must go. Rita Braver reports the latest on the Meese case. Attorney General Edwin Meese evaded reporters' questions today, but his boss said that Meese should not resign, that the Justice Department is functioning just fine. A view uh, not widely held. This erosion of credibility is becoming like a cancer in the Department of Justice. Uh, and everybody wants to get away before it touches them. The blast came as the White House disclosed that on Wednesday, President Reagan, Vice President George Bush, Chief of Staff Howard Baker, and White House Counsel A.B. Culvehouse met with two top-level Justice Department officials who resigned in protest over Mises' conduct. First, according to administration sources, former Deputy Attorney General Arnold Burns told the group that there was a deep malaise in the department, that Meese had lost the moral and legal authority to lead. Then the sources say former Criminal Division Chief William Weld said if he were the prosecutor, he would indict Meese for trading favors with his old friend and former attorney, E. Bob Wallach. Weld is familiar with the evidence against Meese, but the investigation well, uh, is being conducted like by that, independent uh, counsel today, James McKay, uh, who so far says he does not intend to bring an indictment. Uh, Administration sources said the president listened carefully, asked no questions, but seemed shocked by the revelations. Then, after Weld and Burns left, the president called in Meese, who reportedly justified all of his actions and insisted that the Justice Department is functioning well. When both meetings were over, the president endorsed Meese. Well, we don't know what will happen next. All we know is that the Attorney General was functioning and functioning well and that the President uh, uh, expressed his continuing confidence. For Burns, today was the last day at the Justice Department. I have to confess to you that it is indeed a very sad day. Meanwhile, Vice President Bush left on vacation without answering questions about the Attorney General. Still, Mises' problems are expected to become Bush's problems as the presidential campaign heats up. Rita Braver, CBS News, Washington. White House officials say no medical problems were found as President and Nancy Reagan both had checkups today at Bethesda Naval Hospital. His was an x-ray dental exam. Hers was an x-ray breast examination, a follow-up for last October's breast cancer surgery. Severe birth defects, thousands and thousands of abortions. Those are among the effects the federal government is linking to a widely used anti-acne drug. But dermatologists point out the drug helps perhaps tens of thousands every year. CBS News medical correspondent Susan Spencer reports. The government is considering pulling the powerful acne drug Accutane from the shelves because by one estimate it has caused the birth of up to a thousand babies with birth defects in the last six years despite warnings never to use it during pregnancy. We must avoid pregnancy at all costs during Accutane therapy. But internal FDA documents obtained by the New York Times estimate that along with birth defects, Accutane has caused up to a thousand spontaneous abortions. Five to seven thousand others, the FDA estimates, were induced by women who took the drug and later worried about birth defects. The drug's manufacturer has gone to great lengths to publicize the danger. The package insert warns emphatically, do not take Accutane if pregnant. Severe human birth defects are known to occur. We've got a problem and the problem falls between the area of do we deal with labeling, do we deal with something else in regards to the drug. The company disputes the FDA's estimate of the number of birth defects that have occurred, but it is concerned. Well, our response is that, in fact, we're talking about an essential drug that belongs on the market. There are a quarter of a million people that need this drug who receive it every year. Despite the risks, dermatologists would hate to lose this effective treatment, for which many say there is no substitute. I think it's a very good drug when used under the appropriate precautions, when used by responsible physicians and by responsible patients. Sometimes acne can be so severe that it causes both physical and even emotional scarring. And uh, to lose a drug that can be so effective in treating that would be really a crime. Accutane's manufacturer hopes to stop any move to ban or limit the drug's use. A company spokesman said today that instead it will propose new packaging. Packaging which makes that pregnancy warning obvious 
every single time a patient opens a container to take a pill. Susan Spencer, CBS News, Washington. The Senate today began debate on a sweeping new trade bill already passed by the House but bitterly opposed by President Reagan. Few matters of international trade touch Americans more directly than foreign oil. And the price you pay this summer for gasoline may hinge on what happens next week when OPEC meets in Vienna. Also present at that meeting will be a man from Texas. Peter Van Sant has his story. The Texas economy, which runs on oil, ran out of gas with the collapse of world oil prices. Idle oil rigs, thousands of idle workers, bad times in the oil patch. Take a look at the number of bank failures we have today. Almost an all-time record. Uh, the business uh, bankruptcies. The family business is going under. Hard economic times makes for strange bedfellows. Next week, without the approval of the U.S. government, a Texan will attend an OPEC meeting in hopes of helping the cartel raise oil prices. That Texan is Kent Hans of the Texas Railroad Commission, a state agency which for years controlled U.S. oil prices. It's not a question of someone setting the price, it's a question of who's going to set the price and for what reasons. Uh, we're, we're not in love with OPEC. Uh, but uh, I think that we have to look at it, you know, what is best for Texas. What Ken Hans would like to do is to have an artificial prop and make oil prices as high as possible for his Texas producers. While that may be good for Texas, it's bad for the rest of the country. Even in his home state, where higher oil prices would be a boon for the economy, Hans is getting drilled by some critics who think dealing with OPEC is a crude idea. I think we may have a loose cannon and a very powerful position in Texas government now. A half mouth will travel, and once that mouth's traveling, you don't know what's going to come out of it. <laughs> they don't understand it. They don't understand it. I tell you, when they had a good deal was when Texas was in control. Hans's supporters say unless oil prices rise, spurring more domestic production, the U.S. will become dangerously dependent on OPEC oil. If anything, it helps get the oil prices up, but I'd like to see it do it. Maybe we can help them uh, drill something over or something. I don't know. So amid the OPEC oil ministers next week, you may spot a cowboy hat as one Texan works to help OPEC make future trips to the gas station more expensive. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Midland, Texas. Michael Dukakis went at President Reagan's trade policy today. Dukakis said it would be a tragedy if Mr. Reagan vetoes the trade bill, a bill that would make many U.S. companies warn workers of layoffs and plant closings. Both Dukakis and Jesse Jackson have been courting the union labor vote in proud but hurting industrial Pennsylvania and Ohio. They're not just trying to beat each other in the next round of primaries. They want to win back for the Democrats an important group of voters nationwide on Election Day. Bruce Morton reports now on the Democrats and the Blue Collar Blue. Thurton is a dying town with dying steel mills south of Pittsburgh in the Monongahela Valley. Meet some of the men who live here and who work or worked in the mills. This election is about their lives. It's sad to see that this valley go down the drain like it has gone. It's just a shame. What we have to do now, we have to definitely look at a team that is going to come in, and I'm saying a Democratic team. Jackson, he is talking the, the mill workers' language. Retrain our workers. Let's rebuild America and put Americans back to work. We need a candidate that can win as far as uh, bringing the Democratic Party together, as far as uh, working with labor. We're going to have to look at Mr. Dukakis and a good vice president to come in and do the job. I think Dukakis is winnable. He, he can win. Michael Dukakis will probably get the most votes in this valley. He is right on labor's issues, too. We're going to have a national plant closing law that gives us notice, that gives you notice, and that makes sure that we treat people right. But there is sincere respect for Jesse Jackson. I think Jesse Jackson has to be there somehow to bring, to bring the vote together and uh, to bring the Democratic Party together. Of course, it isn't just the old steel towns. That used to be labor in Pennsylvania. The big unions now are the teachers, the service employees. The economy is changing. They have had to take jobs that still use some of their skills, but only pay them half as much money. And that's tough to take a 50% pay cut. A lot of people around this area are suffering. Right here in the city of Clareton, uh, they lost the police force. They can't afford the police force. No money. State police only now. Will traditional Democrats here come back to their party? Oh, I think they'll come home. I think they learned their lesson. They know the good old days won't come again, but 
We suffered a lot in this valley through the Republican regime, and we, they just forgot about us. We're looking for someone to come in and help us, and I think we have to look at the Democratic Party to try to make this move. Talking Union. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Clareton, Pennsylvania. And still to come on the Friday, CBS Evening News. Leslie Stahl on cultural exchanges with the Russians and the problem of paying the piper. And Eric Ingberg on playing the big league blues in Baltimore. It's not unusual that Subaru has sold a lot of cars. What is unusual is how many of them are still running. An astonishing 92% of all Subarus registered since 1978 are still on the road. And now if you buy a Subaru, you'll get back as much as $2,000. Of course, that $2,000 may not be built to last, but at least you know your Subaru is. Red Lobster. We know how you love shrimp. Lots of shrimp. So here's 29 shrimp, four different ways, all in one dinner. Succulent shrimp cocktail, sizzling shrimp scampi, crispy fried shrimp, and savory stuffed shrimp. It's the ultimate shrimp lover's feast. 29 shrimp, four different ways. This week at Red Lobster. And now, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, too, enjoy the shrimp and crab feast. Just $10.95. And kids' popcorn shrimp, just 99 cents. Suddenly, homes all across America are opening. They're opening for Coldwell Banker's annual spring open house celebration. More homes than ever before, so you're sure to find the one that's right for you. Just call your nearest Coldwell Banker office. But hurry, spring doesn't last forever, and neither does our open house celebration. Coldwell Banker, expect the best. A member of the Sears Financial Network. Following this week's clashes with Iran, President Reagan has reportedly decided to change the rules he set in motion in the Persian Gulf and finally allow U.S. warships to come to the aid of any vessel under attack. Up to now, the U.S. Navy was assigned only to protect U.S. flagged ships. Mikhail Gorbachev expressed frustration today with what he called the slow pace of negotiations on a strategic arms treaty. Gorbachev met with Secretary of State Schultz to prepare for next month's summit conference. The Soviet leader said the two sides seem to be marking time on the arms treaty. Schultz said they're trying hard to work out many difficult problems. Gorbachev also made a public appearance today with the man reputed to be his chief rival inside the Kremlin. Barry Peterson has that story. Lenin's birthday with all eyes on the man sitting to the right of Mikhail Gorbachev, his bitter opponent and the number two man in the Politburo, Igor Ligachev. His appearance came amid swirling rumors that he has been politically destroyed in a fierce showdown with Gorbachev behind the Kremlin walls. He was conspicuously absent at several previous events where a trusted Gorbachev ally was standing in. Ligachev and other conservatives have opposed the rapid implementation of perestroika. They also oppose Glasnost, which is bringing more freedom of the press, especially criticism of former Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. They want an image of a strong man. They don't want to look at the past that they're associated with and see that it's bad. According to some reports, Ligachev has been stripped of his role as the party's ideological boss. His control of Soviet TV and newspapers taken away. Foreign Minister Shevardnadze tonight denied there's been any change in Ligachev's position. There's no sign of any conflict situation. So you, uh, the information that you have is erroneous. If Ligachev is neutralized, it may ease the danger to Gorbachev from opponents in the Army and the KGB, who are unhappy about changes that are diminishing their influence. If Gorbachev has beaten his chief opponent, it means he's at the height of his power since he took over three years ago. Barry Peterson, CBS News, Moscow. As President Reagan prepares for the election year summit in Moscow, there are glitches from his past summits with Gorbachev. One example, the agreement on more U.S.-Soviet cultural exchanges. CBS News National Affairs correspondent Leslie Stahl reports tonight Mr. Reagan has not put money where his arts policy is. When the Russian defector Mikhail Baryshnikov danced with the Bolshoi in Boston, U.S.-Soviet relations took another leap forward. 
But if Secretary of State Schultz hadn't stepped in at the last minute, and if Governor Dukakis hadn't left the campaign trail to call home, Barishnikov and the most ambitious of all U.S.-Soviet cultural exchanges might never have gotten off the ground. Astonishingly, one week before opening night, barely any tickets had been sold. Pretty close to disaster. Uh, maybe 12, 24 hours away from bankruptcy. People were considering canceling the entire festival. We wanted very much to uh, make sure that this went forward and Secretary Schultz was helpful. He said that the Soviets would never understand that this had fallen apart due to fundraising. They would think it was an attempt to create an international problem. The Reagan administration provided heavy pressure, but no money. A last-minute bailout from the state and Boston businessmen rescued the festival so hundreds of Soviets and Americans could play together on stage <laughs> and backstage. You who is there interpreter outside? This Boston festival is the face of Ronald Reagan's detente, one of the early results of his change in attitude toward the place he used to call the evil empire. Because of that change, we are on the threshold of an explosion in U.S.-Soviet cultural exchanges. In New York, an art exhibit from Leningrad, postponed eight years ago when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. In Atlanta, a satellite chat featuring gymnast Olga Corbett. Yes. That's little Olga. But all this goodwill glasnost costs a lot. Several orchestras have had to cancel trips to Moscow. Unlike state-subsidized Soviets, Americans in the land of capitalism are on their own. For the Dance Theater of Harlem, being chosen by our government was a mixed blessing. There's a prestige to it, and it's a wonderful honor, but it, unfortunately it takes dollars and cents to go. I should be rehearsing and preparing, but I'm out fundraising. When you look at $200 billion deficits and uh, all that that means, the government can only play a minor role financially in that kind of thing. The administration insists we can't afford not to have cultural exchanges. They're an important tool in our foreign policy. But if the government can't afford to help, those footing the bill worry about the future of this artful side of superpower politics. Hurrah! Hurrah! Leslie Stahl, CBS News, Boston. The Internal Revenue Service today revoked the tax-exempt status of the scandal-tart and bankrupt PTL television ministry. PTL officials have said tax-exempt status is essential to the ministry's survival. In Joliet, Illinois today, two explosions ripped through a grain elevator complex, killing at least two people, injuring three others. Another three people were reported missing. The blast leveled two grain silos at the ADM Growmark complex, about 40 miles southwest of Chicago. Officials believe grain dust may have caused the first explosion, which ruptured a natural gas main, touching off the second blast. When you choose someone to help you sell your home, you want it to be somebody you can trust. Maybe that's why Century 21 is the number one home selling system in America. We know a whole lot about trust. Come with us. Get the picture. Put your trust in number one. You've just been caught knocking off the Kellogg's Cracklin' Oat brand. What's the most intelligent way to respond? Did you eat all the Cracklin' Oat brand? Define the word eat. Did you eat all the Cracklin' Oat brand? Yo, Mom, you sure? Please. Did you eat all... Yeah. With the crunchy sweet taste of Kellogg's Cracklin' Oat brand, an open box is an empty box. Painful conditions are a fact of life in a modern hospital. And when it comes to relieving everyday pain, the overwhelming choice of hospitals is Tylenol. Tylenol is clinically proven effective for all kinds of pain. That's a medical fact. And there's another important thing you should know. Hospitals can trust Tylenol not to irritate your stomach. 
In fact, unlike aspirin or even ibuprofen, Tylenol is so easy on your stomach, most ulcer patients can use it. Tylenol. It's tough on pain, easy on your stomach. A leader of anti-Marxist rebels in Mozambique has been assassinated in Portugal. Police found the body of 44-year-old Evo Fernandes at the side of a road near Lisbon. He'd been shot in the head. Hundreds of thousands of people have died in more than 10 years of civil war in Mozambique. Hundreds of thousands more have fled the country into neighboring states, including white-ruled South Africa. Correspondent Martha Teichner reports from the border. Last year, this fence killed more than 50 people. The South Africans designed it to kill anybody who touches it. Charged with 3,000 volts of electricity, it stretches 40 miles along South Africa's border with...